Barcelona's community, and welcome back to Munich, Germany. We are coming to the end of what has been an incredibly inspiring day one at Telesphere. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined all day here in the cockpit with Rob Streche. What a ride we have been on today. I, I think it's been fantastic. I mean, the amount of customers that they've brought to bear that have been able to share use cases and stories about their transformation has been just fantastic. I know. I feel smarter. I feel more efficient. I, I dare say I feel optimized. Absolutely. Here to join us in, in continuing that journey is Rudy. Rudy, welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you. It is a busy week for you, I know. Yeah. And before we get in to some of the nitty-gritty, I just have to ask, because you have a unique job title. You are the Lead Transformation Evangelist. What does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, I mean, probably we picked this job uh, job description or title because it sounds better than the cross mining dinosaur. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, so, oh, nice visuals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know, uh, because I'm in the cross mining business now for longer than Salonis exists for 15 years. Uh, I You're met, kind of an OG in cross yeah, mining. Right. I, I met, love that. You know, I met the godfather of cross mining back in 2009 yeah. and realized that this technology has the power to change the way we, or at least I, am looking at business processes. You know, long story short, we became a partner, we became a competitor. My company was acquired by, by a big RPA vendor. And then I left, and then Alex gave me a call and said, okay, enough competing with you, join me, and let's fight together. Now, and my job really is now, I, I still have this passion for post mining after 15 years. I think it's great, and I've seen all the development over time, the evolution, and now really using post mining to not only to discover the business, but really to transform business. And because of the passion and the transformation approach, I'm the transformation evangelist that you are. Uh, at the Lord, oh, sorry, sorry for that. that. <laughs> you almost went the wrong way. <laughs> you're not, you're not a big Alex is on next, so be careful. Yeah, we just discussed what we are. But, but I, I think one of the things we were talking when you first came up here, you just got off stage where you were talking about, you know, autonomous value creation mm -hmm. and where does Salonis kind of fit in that? Because to me, that's... That's really a very fascinating thing, and we've been talking about the value creation equation and right. how the processes really get there, especially with AI. I could easily talk for hours about this, but I try to keep it short. Um, you know, when we talk about autonomous systems, probably the way or the way people learn about autonomous is autonomous driving. You know, we are all familiar with autonomous cars in San Francisco, especially or the Wii Robot um, presentation from Elon Musk recently. And if you think about the autonomous car, you need, you need situation awareness, so the car needs to know what's going on. You need a system of values, you need a roadmap, you need a decision intelligence to look at the data, the situation to be, and the situation as it is to make the right decision. You need a system drive by wire to operate uh, the engine, the brakes, and the, the steering wheel. And if you, like, transfer or transfer this to an, to an enterprise. We have situation awareness with process mining. We know what the process should look like because we define the process with business process management. Now we add AI to the picture so AI can make the decisions. We have systems for drive by wire. We have automation. We have, we have orchestration engine, you know, really to operate the systems in the organization. So if you really take it like to the, to the next level and think about it, you know, an autonomous enterprise is something like colonizing the Mars. Probably some time, maybe in the future, maybe not, I don't know. But you start at the bottom, you start with automating tasks, and you infuse AI to it. In this way, you make the task autonomous. If you have enough of these autonomous tasks, maybe your, your process will become autonomous. Your business operations, like accounting, will become autonomous, where humans are only managing the exceptions and provide the guardrails. And then maybe one day the autonomous enterprise will be a reality, or maybe not. I don't think so. And I, I bet that we will earlier see autonomous driving than we will see any autonomous enterprises around. What sort of value add and benefit does that provide to the multitude of customers you have across verticals? You know, process mining typically is or was considered to be like the x ray system for business processes, right? If, if it hurts, you, you take the screen or you take the snapshot and you understand where the pain comes from, and then you hand it over to someone else to fix the problem. You would never send the customer home with a broken arm and the best wishes for the future and the best x-ray picture in the world. And the way we think about it really is so we need to, we need to 
to add like actual and some activities to the to this formula to create value and value is all this is all about you know so if you take the insights from first smiling combine it with actions then you really create value and the shorter the distance between insights and action really is so if you take for example you discover there's um some sort of deviation maybe a process or an invoice was checking approved by the same person of course you can inform someone but you can also trigger an automation a board from any RPA and that really doesn't matter what it is just do something about the problem I mean this board can automatically block this invoice from being paid it can notify someone to recheck and refer this invoice so it's about dealing with issues before they become a real problem and it's more like you know predictive because if we use AI we see the pattern from the past so we can very very early detect or in some deviations and potential problems and deal with it before it really hits the customer. So there's a lot of value to it. So what an incredible amount of value yeah. nobody has to deal with a poor experience. Right. And, and what you're talking about is even more than just uh, the automation aspect of it and the, for the value creation. It's really about how you have that end-to-end -end process view. And because we look at it and go, AI is really good at things. Like doing something, mm -hmm. uh, one activity or one feature, you know, kind of a function. Yeah. Processes tend to go beyond that. So, how do you see when you're talking to organizations about them wrapping their heads because they have very complex processes that they've yeah. made and they really managed inside of Solomon? Right. You know, First of all, we have this capability to extract data from various systems. So basically, there's almost no limitation to the extraction. So we can really visualize, analyze processes end to end, no matter how many systems it crosses, no matter how many systems are involved. And this gives you a visibility into the, the real situation as it is, like no other technology in the world. That's what I realized, you know, back in 2009 when I saw it, I was like, wow, you know, this is just amazing. And, and if you know what's going on, of course you can you can react, and you can also be become proactive, because if you have seen the patterns in the past, as I said, you know, and where you can train your AI to recognize these patterns and provide you with solutions, maybe even before you even notice there's a problem. And you know, just one interesting fact: Do you know how many facts humans are able to process when we make a decision? I'm okay. very curious. It's seven plus minus two. I was going to guess three. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe you and maybe that. Women are, you know, you try to say. Definitely. Anyway, if you're under stress, then maybe it comes down to five yeah. experts that can deal with more facts because, again, they have the experience to recognize patterns earlier to, to distinguish the, the, the relevant facts from the irrelevant facts, but not more than nine, max. But with AI, you know, AI can cause like unlimited facts and it can help you to take the right decision, either assisted, augmented, or autonomous, where you only step in if there's an exception. But AI will really enable us humans to take to make better decisions and to create more value in the process for our organizations. What are some of the, and they could be MVPs, POCs, or, or full-scale deployments, examples of AI that you've seen in your customers mm -hmm. that have really got you excited or made you feel like you're starting to realize this? Recently, I had a meeting with the chief digital officer from a large um, insurance company, and he told me that today they are processing claims automatically with support of AI. And if the AI decides to pay, they pay. No questions asked. Nobody will look into it. They simply pay. And, you know, he said, of course, I know sometimes we are wrong, but it doesn't matter because we save so much money that we can afford it to pay like 1% of claims we should not pay. But if the AI decides not to pay, then this is an exception for them. It will be, you know, they will, they like, they will have some humans look into it, talk to the customer, really investigate, and really try to understand if this claim is legitimate or not. Because he said, you know, the biggest, the biggest like threat for us is not to pay if it's a real claim, because this will drive the customer crazy. They won't like us anymore. They will tell all their friends about how bad our service is. We cannot afford this. But if AI says, says pay, we do. Wow, that seems like a shift. I hope this, you know, if you want to whisper to us later who this is so we can potentially adjust our insurance accordingly, I think that would be 
very, um, very valuable. But, I, but that is a really sensitive thing, and I think there can be there's a lot of implications and ramifications there, both on the good side as well as a, a unique side. Yeah, and I, I think playing off of what you're both talking about, I think when you start to look at human in the loop and business models and business model transformation, how yeah. much of your job is getting into looking at companies that may be looking to change their business model a little bit because again that's that that's definitely a radical way like you said hey we'll bring you know we throw it out as an exception there's human in the loop they take a look at it so we cut down the amount of time we pay better all the tables update in the back end how much of your job and what you see Salona is playing in is helping people change their business models I could say 100%, but it would probably not, not completely. Um, in the long run, definitely yes. So, you know, this, this technology has the power to transform the way people run business in a, you know, in a, in a very sustainable way. Um, but not everybody is there yet. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a progress. It's a, it's a journey. And, of course, it starts with the first step. So you first need to understand what your processes are. You know, the reaction is always the same. People are shocked by the, what we call spaghetti monster, you know, the 5,000 variations in one picture. Um, but then you start to make sense out of it, and you, you look into exceptions, you try to understand where your, your exceptions are. And let me give you another example. You know, one of our applications we're currently using, so it's about credit blocks. Not the most exciting topic, of course, but if you're dealing with customers, they really want to get their orders, but maybe they have not paid all their invoices yet. So the AI will analyze it, and it will not only give you a recommendation, but it will also give you like a reasoning. Why should you delete the trade block, or why shouldn't you? And you can follow the recommendation. Of course, we are tracking how often people follow the recommendation, and if we see if we hit a certain threshold, like 99%, we can flip the switch, and from that moment, it will go automatically, as long as we, say, delete the credit block and deliver the goods. Again, if the recommendation is not to delete the credit block, this is considered to be exception. It goes to a human, call sales, call the customer, try to sort out the situation and make the customer make sales happy. We had a great conversation with Rafa about that earlier today, and the, the incredible reduction in time that they have seen in that process and the ability to increase their throughput and, yeah. and deliver faster yeah. and with a, with a higher margin. It's actually a really fascinating discussion. So I have two final questions for you. I saw that you took a unique break in between your last two gigs, and I'm curious how you optimized your time on the slopes during that time. <laughs> What did I do? <laughs> well, you know, I, I live in Austria in the mountains, so for me the slopes are only like 20 or 30 minutes away. So what I did, you know, after I took my kids to school, I had the skis in the back, and 20 minutes later I was already on on the mountain. That's and a process optimization. Right. 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 You know, you've been in this world for so long, I figured there had to be some efficiency that you took in, in, in no, that. No, but, but seriously, you know, um, once you are on this journey and you keep about thinking about, about efficiency and risk all the time, it somehow starts to affect your daily life. Absolutely. And sometimes you will have some weird discussions in your family because not everybody is on the same track, of course. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, even like, how do you sort the, the dishes in the dishwasher to optimize oh the process? Like, you know, let's put, all, let's put all the spoons together so you can simply take them out like, as one and put them in the drawer and not to distribute them all over the place. But <laughs> that's a... I actually, so I really, I, I relate to that a lot. I've, I've always ran my company all remote when I'm not on site. I have to work at home because I'm obsessed with efficiency, yes. and it, and which is why we're a great fit to be here. But it, it physically hurts me when people are inefficient. I can't handle it. It's like yes. a cheese grater to my brain. It probably blends into my neural spiciness as well, but I... I have to be a part of efficient systems, yeah. or I feel like I'm wasting my life and melting completely. So I'm not surprised that, that your, your dishwasher came up in this case and, and that you were able to get to the slopes in 20 minutes given that you know, I, I have the same brand of socks in the same size and the same color. So I don't have to sort so you them. you have to match. 
Yeah, I don't have to match them. Just pick two, and it always fits. I love that. My, my friend, Sean, Scott Douglas Thomas, is a shout-out to you, Boo. He is the exact same way. He was the one who taught me about stock efficiency because we're both OCD, efficient, borderline monsters, or unicorns, or magical creatures, yeah, however you want to look at it. But, but I appreciate that you said that. I'm, on the other hand, because I'm just a colorful person, I've just accepted that they won't match. And I don't care as long as they're the same style of stock, so I'm not uncomfortable in my booth. Rob, do you have any efficiency OCDs? Now I, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm very inefficient when it comes to clothing. <laughs> that, is, that is for sure. I'm quite highly inefficient clothing. Well, we'll have to apply some on it to your closet and, and layer out the most straight oh, lines. That's my new closet. I'm very efficient packing. I'm very well, I love inefficient that. I love that. I love that. Uh, clothing-wise. But, you know, <laughs> yes. Right. yes. All right. Last question for you, Rudy. Since you are one of the OGs, a part of the process mining royalty, if you will, and, and sort of founding fathers, I'm sure we'll have you back on the show at, at okay. next Cellosphere. What do you hope to be able to say then that you can't say now? Well, I want every customer to see implementing object-centered process mining. And by the way, I really don't like the term because it's very academic, it's very technical. I refer to it as business mining because the process is a process and business is a combination of all your processes. You know, this technology has so much transformation power really to help people understand process end to end. And I want to see every customer implementing our latest product, the orchestration engine, because with the orchestration engine we can really deliver on the promise of end to end automation that RPA gave but never actually could deliver. Because we create, we provide like wrappers around scenarios. And we have some great, great examples that I will be more than happy next year to to be used to some of the, the implementations and the value it creates for our customers. Well, we can't wait to hear all of those, Rudy, and hear more about your personal efficiencies and examples <laughs> from um, on next week's show. Rob, thank you for sharing and always having great yep. insights. And thank all of you for tuning in to our 11th out of 12 segments here at Salon and Cellosphere. My name is Savannah Peterson here in Munich, Germany. Be sure and drop your personal OCD efficiencies in the comments. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.